Welcome to the Patricia Fripp Sales Series. I'm very excited to be introducing to you my friend Troy Harrison. He is the sales navigator, an expert sales trainer and consultant, and the author of the book, Sell Like You Mean It. Welcome, Troy, and can you give us a snapshot of your sales career? Thank you, Patricia. I'm glad to be here, and yes, I can. I've been in various forms of selling or sales management since 1990. I actually started out selling new cars, which is just a wonderful education for a salesperson. I uh, spent most of my career in the business-to-business -business world, uh, industrial supplies, managed services, and so forth. Uh, but I really discovered, uh, I guess, my calling when I became a sales manager. But as, as much as I love doing selling, as much as I love selling, I love teaching it that much more, and I love solving problems with sales that much more. So in 2004, I hung out my own shingle, started my own sales training and development company, and I've never looked back. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work with clients literally all over the world, uh, not just in my own hometown here in Kansas City, and uh, every client's a new challenge, every client is a new opportunity, uh, and I have fun with all of them. So I guess I'm in love with my profession. Good. And I'm sure you'll agree what is a great, one of the greatest benefits of our business is that it's a great education for us because we learn so much from our clients that then when we go serve others, we have even broader experience. Oh, no question. You know, the, the, I always like to tell people that some of my best sales trainers have been my clients. If I, I always like to tell people that the best market research starts when you ask somebody to actually cut a check. Yes. Uh, focus groups are wonderful, but until you ask somebody to buy, you really don't know what the market's going to bear. Now, you've had a, a long sales career. You've been helping other clients in different industries since 2004. What have been the biggest changes going back as far as you want to go? The biggest change, Patricia, is the rise of what I call the educated customer. Mm. Uh, customers now are sharper and more savvy than they were 15, 20, 25 years ago. And what's interesting is the internet, and everybody understands this part, the internet has made product and service information so much more accessible that your customers can literally know everything about your product uh, before they start interacting with you. And if they don't know it before they start, you know, as soon as you bring up a model number, they can pick up their smartphone and they can have the whole features and benefits list right in front of them. That's part of it. But the other part is customers have become so much more educated to what salespeople do to them. The, the old techniques, the manipulative techniques, the, the ways that salespeople will use words and questions to try and back a customer into a corner where they, where they supposedly have to buy. And you know, it's, it's like customers now in, in a sales call with some people who are using the outdated sales techniques, techniques, it's like they're watching a play and they know the salesperson's next line before the salesperson says it. Yeah. It's, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So we have to treat customers in a new fashion nowadays. We, we have to have straightforward dialogue that respects the customer's uh, intentions. It respects the customer's intelligence. And most of all, it respects the customer's buying process. Because if we don't do those things, our customers have the opportunity to reject us. This, this same internet that has educated them now can facilitate their purchasing habits without any intervention from a sales rep. Well, if we're changing the relationship with them and they're more educated, so we know as salespeople then, we, you know, we have to adapt to the customers. So are there other ways that these changes affect customers? I think customers are more, I think they're more knowledgeable about the power and control that they have over the sales process wow. nowadays. You know, for years, and, and this is an, an old canard, salespeople used to fool themselves that they had control over the customer. 
and, and when I say fool themselves, I really do mean fool themselves because customers always have the right to opt out of our selling process. But here's the thing. It used to be that the customers were less willing to do so because they thought, to heck with it. If I don't deal with this guy, I got to deal with the next guy. And now they don't have to deal with a guy. So, and, and customers have educated themselves so much more about the control that they have in the selling process that if a salesperson tries to fool themselves or their customers into thinking the control relies with the salesperson, uh, the customer's just out of there. Mm. So again, it, it affects that relationship. It affects the way that we have to approach our customers. And how does this affect sales managers? <clears throat> I think sales managers uh, require new techniques too. You know, one of the oldest truths in business that I have seen is the way that you treat your employees is directly reflected in the way that they'll treat their customers. Well, sales managers used to have a, shall we say, less than partner relationship with their salespeople. A lot of times that relationship could be very adversarial. Uh, and then that was reflected in the way that salespeople treated their customers. And it was all okay because that was the expectation up and down the line. It's not that way now. And sales nowadays focuses less on the words that you say than on the interaction between you and the customers. And I'm thinking back to a sales, per to a sales manager that I had, uh, God, this was 15 years ago. And he and I would, he, you know, he, he was a good guy. He liked to post mortem every sale and we would post mortem the sale. And if the sale didn't happen, it was always the same conversation. Well, did you say this? Did you use this word? And I finally just got to the point. I finally stopped him one day and, and I said, Bill, look, I know the words. Yeah. Not everybody's going to buy. I'll post more than these sales. I'll explain to you why they're going to buy. And if you have meaningful coaching, that's wonderful. But don't just open your playbook. You know, don't, don't open to scene four of Macbeth and recite the lines to me and ask if I recited the lines okay. We both know that I know how to do that. And I think that sales managers nowadays, when I see that type of a coaching uh, tactic, it's obsolete. And sales managers need to learn how to coach your salespeople. The other thing that technology has done is it gives a sales manager the ability to spend more time out in the field with their salespeople. Nowadays, if a sales manager is not spending 50% of their time with, a, with their salespeople on coaching and development, you're wasting your time uh, because that is where everything happens. And, you know, it's, it's so much easier to delegate the administrative task I mean, the reports that we used to have to hand tabulate that would take us a day, 30 seconds. Yeah. And so because we've been freed up as sales managers, we have to understand the best use of that freed up time is out in the field coaching our salespeople, building their skills, making them better salespeople, maybe even better than the sales manager ever hoped to be. And if you're not doing that, you're really wasting that time, I think. Good. Right, so we're looking at the more educated consumer, how mm. certainly sales managers have to be better coaches and it's beyond just knowing the words. I want to put you on the spot because I know I have my favorites. Years ago when I started going to seminars, which was probably 1975, I'd take any seminar that I heard of with my pals from the Dale Carnegie class. And some of the lines that I heard, one that's most memorable, and see if you have your other favorite, don't ever use, don't train your salespeople this way. One was, once you make a statement or ask for the business, the next person who speaks loses. Oh, God, I hate that one. <laughs> How can, I, hate, I hate that with a passion. How can it be a relationship? And, and one of my fripicisms in is you don't close a sale. You don't celebrate closing a sale. You celebrate opening a relationship. I like that approach. I still do talk about closing the sale, but only from the perspective of gaining a decision, whether that decision is yes or no. 
because that lets you know that this sales process is over and we're moving into the next phase of the relationship. But Mike and my comment on that, and I actually address that very phrase mm. in every sales training program that I do. My comment on that is if you think somebody's about to lose by buying from you, the only ethical thing you can do is reach down, pick up your proposal, pull it off the table. I want my customers to win by buying from me. Let, let me but as far as some of the phrases, oh my God. Um, well, my, my very first sales training school was in the car sales business. And it was taught by a guy named Tex. <laughs> Tex looked exactly like you're picturing him right now yes. in your head. <laughs> Six foot four, face like an old saddle, 10 gallon hat, big belt buckle, snakeskin boots, <laughs> rhinestone western suit. Good. And Tex's whole philosophy was that you had to control the bar from the time they came on the lot until the time that they left. Yeah. On the second day, I figured out that bar translated to buyer or. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how bad this line was. You know, it, it gives me allergies. But I, on the second day, I learned that bar translated to buyer or customer in English. Yes. Training got a lot easier after that. <laughs> um, I, what, some of the things I hate. Mm -hmm. Always answer a question with a question. Yeah. About the third time that happens when I'm the bar, yeah. uh, I'm going to hit the salesperson. I mean, you know, um, I, you've got to understand, I actually once attempted to watch my sales manager in the car business close a customer after the customer had punched him in the nose and he was bleeding all over his white shirt. <laughs> True story. I can see why this is a great education for a young man considering entering, entering sales for the rest of his life. Well, and I only lasted about three years because I became conscious that not all sales was like that. Yeah. That's the reason I exited that. Uh, but yeah, the first person to talk loses. Uh, you've got to control the customer all the time. Uh, any, any of these old techniques, which I think of as defensive selling. Yes. Defensive selling is a school of thought that says the customer is going to lie to you from start to finish, and your job is to defend yourself against them. Well, you can't build a relationship with somebody if you're anticipating that they're going to lie. And in 25 years, and I don't know how many thousands of sales calls, I found customers to be remarkably honest mm. when they're dealing with me. Customers answer questions that I never thought that they'd answer. Yeah. You know, customers will give you the information that you need to know to, to help them buy if you treat them like intelligent human beings. I had a situation that came up a few days ago. Uh, and, th and this is an example of everything that's wrong with selling. Uh, I have decided that my next motorcycle is going to be a used Harley Davidson Road King. And so I went into a dealership here in Kansas City that had a used Road King in the year that I wanted, in the color that I wanted. And the salesman came out and I was talking to him. Nice enough guy. I said, how much is the bike? He said, well, I don't know. Let's go in and find out. This is permissible. When, it, when I sold used cars, there were times I didn't have the used car price list in my pocket. Okay. So we went inside and the sale, walked up to the sales manager. He introduced me and he said, Troy's interested in that Red Road King outside. And I saw the sales manager flash a look at his salesperson like, watch me tie this guy up. Oh, yeah, exactly. And I thought, good Lord, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and at this point, have you ever considered interjecting, uh, by the way, this is what I do for a living? Give me a moment. <laughs> yeah. I said, how much is the Road King? And he was evasive. Mm -hmm. He said, well, do you have a trade-in? Yes. Well, then you're really only worried about the difference. Well, do you, are you going to finance? Are you going to pay cash? I don't know. I might do either. He said, well, you know, if you're going to finance, all you really care about is the payment per month. I said, look. The payment is a product of the price of your bike, the trade-in allowance on my bike, the interest rate, and the term of the loan. I'm smart enough to know this. Yeah. I'm also smart enough to know what you guys can do by locking somebody into a payment. Let me tell you something further. Mm. I train salespeople for a living. I travel all over the world to train salespeople. <laughs> I know every play you're going to run. I've probably run them before better than you. <laughs> I said, here's what we're going to do now. We're going to press reset. Yeah. 
We're going to have an honest, straightforward conversation in which we ask each other straight questions and give each other straight questions. I am a customer that has a want for your bike and the ability to pay. So mm -hmm. I'm your ideal customer. I'm already giving you great <laughs> information here. First question on the floor, how much for the damn bike? Yeah. <laughs> and he started mealy-mouthing around again. I just pulled the salesman's card out of my pocket, handed it to him. I said, look, give us somebody who will use it. Yeah. I will never be back. Yeah. And it's sad because that bike is still sitting there. I'd, I'd like and to be riding it right now. You I'd like to be riding it right now, but I will not buy from them. That is today's educated customer because today's educated customer can get on the internet and say, there's another one 50 miles from me. I'll just deal with them. Maybe they're nicer. Yeah. And so we as sales, and, and really I have a full training program wrapped around the idea of the type of dialogue that we need to have. But Really, it's just treat your customers like they're intelligent human beings. Literally treat your customers the way you would want to be treated. You're probably going to be okay. Perfect. Now, when people go to TroyHarrison.com, your website, TroyHarrison.com, I know there's a lot of content that they can take advantage of as well as learn about your training program. So what do you offer just for your visitors to help themselves to? Well, first, uh, you can go to the sales blog yeah. and you can read over 300 different sales and sales management articles that are there right now. Yeah. I have a habit of putting at least one and usually two up every week and I never delete them from the server. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything I've written since I started that website, it's on there. Uh, there are also how-to videos, uh, short how-to videos on how to handle different parts of the sales process. Again, those are free. You can learn about my training programs and you can read testimonials from customers who have been through those training programs. Again, totally free. Then you get into uh, the knowledge base that you have to pay for, which is on my products page. I have a number of audio and video sales training products that will help you have the kind of updated sales dialogue with your customers that is not only going to generate one order, it's going to generate a relationship for life. If you're a sales manager or business owner, there are products on there that will help you manage salespeople to do those very things. So it's a full resource center for anybody who wants to make more money through the better use of their sales force, whether they are the salesperson, the sales manager, or the business owner. Perfect. Thank you. So will you tell us what are some of your most popular training programs that mm. companies engage you for? And I know you, you work with, with companies that might be relatively small and others that are very large. I, I do. I mean, I have clients that have sales forces as small as five people yeah. and as large as thousands of people. And I, and I think both of those types of customers would really land on the same types of programs, which is uh, my foundational sales training course, my sell like you mean it sales training course, which is a two day sales training course proven to be very popular. I update it. I used to say I update it every year. Heck, I think nowadays I update it every time I do it. Yeah, of course. Um, but I mean, that's proven popular with customers industry to industry. Uh, other customers like to take certain topics out of that, maybe prospecting, maybe presenting. Uh, to me, the most important phase of that is advanced questioning. Mm. Uh, and then I have customers who like me to teach their sales managers topics like hiring, interviewing, uh, coaching and development. Coaching and skills development is a huge factor. Uh, a lot of times, Patricia, I'll design a course around the needs of a particular customer. Uh, customers don't have to come to me and just go through the file cabinet and select what happens to be in the folders there. They can come to me and say, Troy, here's my problem. Mm. And I can output a sales and or consulting program to help them fix the problem. And I believe this is another way that proves how our industry has changed. Uh, that now our programs have to be a lot more customized and personalized to our clients. Absolutely. You know, the old, there the old phrase, and I guess if we're talking about phrases that we hate, selling is selling is one of those. Yeah. Um, it's not. 
Mm. I mean, there are, I have clients in the same industry. For instance, I, I have several clients in the promotional products industry. And yet I deliver different programs to some of those clients simply because their needs are different. Maybe their markets are different. Maybe their approach is different. Maybe their company culture is different. I have to, we, you and I have to adapt to the needs of those clients. And I think that's probably one of the things that my clients like best about me is that my focus is on what their issues are and how can we solve them. Uh, you know, if a client begins talking to me about sales training, first thing I'm going to do is take a half step back and say, okay, let's find out first if sales training is the issue. Maybe it's process alignment. Maybe you've got the wrong people. Uh, but I, I take a very holistic approach to solving problems and generating results with the sales force and training them becomes a piece of that. All right, good. Now, you, you mentioned one of my hot buttons, which I know everyone's always interested in. Can you give us a little advice from your, your advanced questioning segment? Certainly. I have said for years that the very best trait that a salesperson can possess is intellectual curiosity. Uh, the salesperson who always likes to know more about how things work, about why people do things, about why people say things, that's a salesperson who's going to be very successful. You know, I'll, I'll match up a great questioner against somebody who's strong in any other phase and probably win 80% of the time. Uh, when, when I was selling, I used to love to go on plant tours because I could combine a plant tour with a little bit of questioning and I could always win some business there. Number one piece of advice for questioning, though, make it about them, not about you. In other words, the old leading question strategies, uh, you know, if I, if I could send you to paradise tomorrow at no cost, would you do that? The if I could, would you absurdity? <laughs> yeah. Get rid of that. Instead, make it honest questions yeah. that are designed to learn about their situation, about their needs, and then don't be satisfied with surface answers. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of times a customer will give you a partial answer to a question, not because they're trying to deceive you, just because that's what comes to them at the moment. Drill down. Don't be afraid to continue asking, can you tell me more about that? Why do you think that is? Until you feel like you have all the information. Good. Do those two things and you'll be successful in questioning. Of course, if you want to learn more about it, I've got the products. Okay, of course. And, and certainly, Troy is an expert at, at re in fact, what would you say your clients would say are your strengths and the reason they keep hiring you over and over and, and have you as a consultant? Well, I, the, the, the thing that my clients say is the number one reason they do business with me is, oddly, the number one reason some clients don't do business with me. Mm. And that's because I give it to him straight. Ah. I've decided that at age 47, I'm too old to waste time parsing words. Mm. And so I will tell them what their issues are directly. We will meet them directly. We will solve them directly with a no BS factor. Good. Uh, and then the second piece, again, I think goes back to the adaptability. Mm. I, because I'm not an industry specialist, uh, I, I know a lot of people who are and, and, all of them seem to get stale. I am not an industry specialist, which means that I might see something over here that works really well. And I might go, you know what, with a little tweak and adaptation, that might work really well over here. And so it allows me to bring best practices to the table and adapt them to help all of my clients. Uh, the bottom line is that if my clients use my materials, they grow. Yeah. Uh, sometimes as much as 70% in one year, I have a test case of that, almost always double digits. Good. And, and of course, what, what you are saying and, and what I like so much about the business is we learn a lot from different industries and the techniques are adapted to other industries. And I challenge all my clients Look, you have friends who are in non-competing industries. 
rather than just chat about your ball games or your friends' weddings or or the the everyday conversation we have with our friends, why don't you have a more serious conversation over coffee rather than cocktails and say, look, what does your company training program teach you that might be helpful to me? And this is what we learn in our company that could be adapted. And again, it, it's it's having a mini version of what we celebrate about our business. You know, one of my favorite stories about that, Patricia, is actually yours, and it's the one about speaking to the mobile home convention. Oh, yes, of course. Manufactured housing. Yep. Yes. And the funny part about that is uh, when I was in industrial sales, I used to have a client that did manufactured housing. And I, so I've actually been in a, a, house, a home manufacturing facility hmm. dealing with those people. Um, but it's like you said, it's the adaptability. It's, it's the ability to understand and to take your own mindsets, get out of your head just a little bit, put yourself into their situation and find ways to make their program work. And of course, what I teach our clients is once you have a good prospect or once you have a client and want to remind them of how you serve them and take it to the next level, or even if you're a sales manager who has to inspire your salespeople, what I do is help professionals, whether it's executive or sales professionals, or just ambitious professionals, be more powerful, persuasive, and personable in their presentations. And very much what Troy has been saying is true with having more effective sales and leadership presentations. Uh, the other day, Troy, one of our friends said, Patricia, what is the number one secret of delivering a powerful, persuasive presentation? And I was saying, oh, there's no one secret. And then it hit me that a brand new fripicism was going to about to fall flawlessly from my lips. And I said, although there is no one secret, if there were, it would be that your presentation is of interest to your audience. And that means as a sales professional, just as you were saying, you have to focus the conversation to them. What are their interests, their challenges? Uh, what are their goals? What are, it's just you focus language rather than this is I focus language. And just as we were talking about stories, there is nothing like having an arsenal of happy, satisfied client stories in your back pocket. In other words, rather than say, well, last June, uh, we, we helped this manufacturing company in Cleveland, rather instead say, when I first met with Troy, he's the senior vice president of the manufacturing company in Cleveland. He said, Patricia, help. As you know, we okay actually deliver the dialogue in their words, and then in your words, you can say, so what we did for Troy is probably what we would do for you, Mr. Smith. We would take the three-step process of bullet, 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 bullet. And then if you were talk to Troy, he would say, I would not have believed it possible that under budget and a month ahead of time, we managed to. So certainly you focused and then certainly uh, with good client history stories and talking about the questioning, my favorite question when I hear instructions from me or I'm listening into a sales presentation, I'll say, can you give me a specific example? Because when we have a specific example, we can see all the talking points and the principles and the benefits within an example. So we certainly hope that this has been of value to you and go to troyharrison.com, uh, check out the blog, the free videos, check out uh, Troy's different services and his, his learning programs. And I would challenge you if you want your presentations to be powerful 
and your message memorable and your sales successful. Take a free trial at Fripp, VT for in virtual training dot com and get a free chapter as a thank you from me on openings of presentations, stories, and sales presentations. So with that, Troy, thank you for sharing so much information. Do you have any walk away advice for our friends and listeners? I do. Uh, first of all, uh, some of some of our listeners probably are uh, maybe fans of mine that haven't seen you before. And I, and I just want to thank you for everything you've done to help me in my own presentations. Uh, Patricia is for me, the presentation guru. Uh, so when, when you want to go to that next level on, on presenting, whether it is a sales presentation, whether it is a management presentation, I can't recommend anyone more highly than this lady. Uh, the second thing is for salespeople, um, just focus on your customer. Make sure, make sure that your customer gets what they need out of the dialogue and you'll probably end up getting what you need out of the dialogue. Good. And from Patricia Fripp, I hope you will remember me. However, much more important, remember what FRIP stands for. The sales series is to bring you new ideas or remind you of those that you've forgotten from sales experts. Frequently, my f name stands for frequently reinforce ideas that are productive and profitable. And all learning requires repetition and reinforcement. Check out our resources. Thank you for your attendance.